folks. Welcome to another prospect interview on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed. I am Maxwell Baumbach, and I am joined at this time by one of the most exciting dynamic scorers in the entire world of basketball, for <laughs> being real. Uh, but there's more to his game than that. We're going to talk about that, his whole journey. I'm joined by Jordan Jelly Walker. How are you doing today? Man, I appreciate you having me on this show. For sure. We're, we're really glad to have you. Um, you're obviously going to be in the Portsmouth Invitational, which is coming up. So big yeah. opportunity for you to kind of show off your game and, and show what you can do. Um, but let's start at the, at the very beginning. How did you get into basketball growing up? Uh, my older brother, Ahmad. Ahmad, he, he put the ball in my cradle, as you could say. And, <laughs> and since ever since I was probably five years old, it's been, you know what I'm saying, like the love of my life, you know what I'm saying? So Yeah, yeah been like that since I was five so but definitely mm-hmm. my brother and mom he's the one who taught me everything I know mm-hmm. and I just built on it as I got older and kept practicing what he taught me were there like players or teams or like anybody that you watched growing up where you're like man that guy like that that's a guy that like I want to take after that's a guy yeah, that's yeah like- for sure for sure um I mean, when I was younger uh Steve Nash was still in the league yeah yeah I liked him because he was little um, mm-hmm. I love hot sauce. I'm from New York. So they yeah, have, yeah. The animal mm-hmm. tape stuff. That's when it first started mm-hmm. to come out on YouTube too. Cause I'm born mm-hmm. in 99. So I would say around like the 2005, 2006 era, that's when like, and one mixtape started. And that's when people started going on YouTube heavy for mixtapes and stuff. Like yeah. That. Yeah. So hot sauce, of course, um, Kyrie, mm-hmm. cause, uh, in the tri-state area, I don't know about like from like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, in like that area, we had something called MSG Varsity. Okay. And it was something like back in the day, it used to have like its own demand channel. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, so like you could rewatch every like game that was on MSG Varsity and they mm-hmm. were always going from New Jersey to Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So I, I was watching all the Kyrie Irving's games when he was at uh, St. Pat's. That's the reason why I ended up going to that high school. Oh, that's cool. But yeah, mm-hmm. I watched all of his high school games every day. Every day, like... <laughs> When I got from school, I would play, mm-hmm. so like run it back, and then I would watch him play every every day after school. So Kyrie was a person. Uh, John Wall, yeah, I actually, I actually got got to meet recently. So mm-hmm. yeah, I used to watch him all the time and his mixtapes and stuff. So those are and LeBron James, obviously, like mm-hmm. that's my goal. John Wall is like crazy underappreciated. Yeah. And like, so like I so his his freshman year of college was my freshman year of college. Oh, okay. And like people like. I don't think like, like, obviously like you get, like you get John wall, like you're, you're watching him, but like people don't appreciate, like he was like a cultural phenomenon when yeah. he was in college, like his one and done season. Like he did that dance at a pepper rally and everybody in my college was doing it at parties. Next Bro, like he was, he was a huge deal. He was like one of the biggest players ever back in the day. Like, especially that's what I'm talking about. The mixtape game. Like that's when mm-hmm. the mixtape started to come and his hoop mixtape, when he was at Holy Rams, when he did the sham guard in the purple and go mm-hmm. it with the left, like, bro, everyone, everyone yeah. knows about John Wall. But yeah, yeah, those yeah. are probably the people I, I watched most when I was younger. As I got older, I started to watch different people, like, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying, to incorporate in my game and stuff like that. Um, so for people that are sort of unfamiliar with the backstory, where did where did the Jelly nickname come from? Because <laughs> that kind of ties into a lot of the stuff that we yeah, talk yeah, about. Yeah, I get all the like time, but I'm part of the – the Jelly Fam. And yeah, like, yeah. Group of us. It's me, Leandre Washington, Isaiah Washington, Javon Quinterly, as people probably know about that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sydney Wilson, Pedro Marquez, and Melissa Reed, who was at – she was actually in the NCAA tournament this year with Ole Miss. Mm-hmm. I mean, St. John's. She was at Ole Miss. Yep, yeah. I, I don't think I'm forgetting any. I think those are all of them. And Najee Reed. Najee yeah, Reed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Najee Reed. So that, that's with part of Jelly Fam and – Jelly is just like a, a finger roll layup, you know, and mm-hmm. put your own flavor on it, I guess. Um, but yeah, I've been Jelly Fam since I was in eighth grade, you know, and it blew up when we were in high school. It definitely blew up, I would say, like worldwide, where people, everyone was saying that Jelly instead of, yeah, thing, I would say probably my junior year going into my senior year, like that junior, senior year before I went to college, that's mm-hmm. when Jelly Fam got like it was, it was like. It was big, yeah. It was worldwide. You couldn't escape it. Like if you yeah, were just like involved, like if you followed basketball yes, and like you know, basketball it, culture, like it, it came up. Yeah. Yes. So basically my name's Jordan. And we're all the crazy part, the funny part is like 
when we were all at our separate schools, like everyone calls us jelly. I'm saying, I don't know about yeah. Nazi. I mean, maybe I would say, yeah, because at LSU, they were calling him big jelly. So everyone mm -hmm. at our own separate places, like they would call us jelly. You're all jelly. Yeah. I'm saying so. Mm -hmm. it would, but when we get around each other, like they call me J-O, like, you know what I'm saying? Isaiah, we call them Dimes or Zay. You know what I'm saying? Pedro, we call him Pay. Leandre, we call him Dre. Like, feel me? So stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, my coach, like, and I feel like everyone around me just called me jelly so much. It was to the point the announcers and stuff started calling me jelly. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? It was as if people really thought that was my real name. Like, my name is Jordan, but the J and the J just goes together. So I just, my nickname is just jelly. So that's what mm -hmm. people call me. And I feel like that's like my, my basketball nickname. Like, when people, like, you know, some people like CP3 for Chris Paul. Yeah, yeah. Like, jelly is my nickname. Mm hmm so you, uh, you were pretty, you gained a lot of steam like throughout, throughout high school. Yeah. Um, you end up going to Seton hall yep. and I think like a lot of people that are like, kind of like late to the party with you. They're like, Oh no, he's like the guy, he's the guy from UAV. Yeah. Um, but like you, you started at Seton hall and you didn't get a ton of playing time there yeah. and you transferred and this is pre transfer portal. This is before the days of yeah. everybody transfers. Exactly. So there was, so there was like a little bit of a stigma to it back then. Absolutely. I mean, um, so yeah, so like when you did that, what was what was your thought process? How did you kind of get through the adversity of that stigma? And like what advice would you give to to players who were in the situation that you were in? Where you know you go to school, it's not maybe what you thought it was, it didn't work yeah. out a certain way, and yeah. and now you're you're kind of questioning if, if you made the right choice. I mean, well, seeing Hall, like a lot of people think I left because I wasn't getting any minutes and that that was never me. Like if people knew my story from before I went to college, like I, I never started on any team. Okay. I didn't even play in high school till my junior year. Oh, and really? I didn't okay. Didn't start on a team until my senior year of high school. Interesting. Okay. Saying, so me not getting minutes has never been like a big deal for me. I, I tore mm -hmm. the ligaments in my thumb. Okay. Uh, the second game of the season at Seton Hall, and I thought I was going to get a red shirt. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Then come back next year, a freshman all over again, instead of wasting that year because my finger was hurt. You know what I'm saying? Damn near the whole year. Yeah. Till I ended up getting surgery towards the end of the year, right before March Madness. And then obviously it felt better months later. And I have no problem with it now, but that's, I thought I was going to be able to get the register and I didn't. So that's mm -hmm. another story. But um, yeah, I mean, the stigma of transferring back then was, was like, oh, he's a head case or, oh, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want to sit behind players or, you know what I'm saying? Oh, he doesn't want to buy into the culture and, and it's not really none of that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, then like, sorry to cut you off, but it's also weird. Cause like at the time it was like, you had to sit out a year. Yes. If you wanted to yeah, transfer. The, so it wasn't like, Oh yeah. Oh, he doesn't want to sit behind people. It's like, we see to sit out a full year to go exactly, somewhere else. Like, exactly. It can't, my can't point. be the entire story. Exactly. My point. So like, and that's was the stigma. That was the stigma behind it. Like even when Javon Corney left Villanova, like, and he spoke to me about it before he left, you know what I'm saying? He's like, Hey, this people is what I'm about doing. Da, da, da. Like, how did you get through it? And I said, Bro, at the end of the day, like people are going to say what they want about you. You know what I'm saying? And we're not, I'm not a player that people don't know who I am. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, a part mm -hmm. of the Jelly Fam. My name is already well known in basketball because of the Jelly Fam stuff. Not in for what I've done in college yet, but for what, like just because of who I am and Instagram and social media was getting so, like, I would say big by my senior year and going into my freshman year. That's when social media was. Like, you know, skyrocketing and stuff like that. So um, uh, it was difficult, but I had to just tell myself that, hey, people are going to talk about you regardless, whether you do good, yeah. things, whether you do bad things. And that's social media nowadays. You know what I'm saying? You mm -hmm. see people all the time now critiquing stuff that they have no idea about. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. that's just what comes with it. Everyone has a voice in social media or so everyone thinks they have a voice. You know what I'm saying? That mm -hmm. matters. So I just had to get through the point where it's like, hey, at the end of the day, Oh, you hear mm -hmm. still? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's uh, at the end of the day, it's just, uh, um, uh, everyone has, I mean, you just gotta ignore it, you know? And yeah, the yeah, sit yeah, out yeah. year stuff, mm -hmm. whew, that was the hardest year of my life. Yeah, so uh, what's that like? So, the hardest year of my life. So, far. what, like, like are just you not being able to travel with the team, not being able mm -hmm. to play basketball, like, play and just sitting the bench and just watching people play? And, in my year at Tulane, when I sat out, that's when we went 0-18 in conference play. And I'm thinking to myself, like, Brian, I know, like, I know I could, I could help this team.
Mm -hmm. So, oh. all right, we lost him. I'm going to, I'm going to get him back on real quick, but this is, this has been a great conversation so far. Um, we're going to reach out to him and get him back on the show here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. And I think this stuff that it's important to talk about, like, I think it's something that, that I try to be cognizant of is the fact that like everybody reads everything. Right. And like, it's, I'll say one of the biggest surprises for me when I first started to do any sort of basketball media, any, any public facing work um, in basketball, it's just, this world's a lot smaller than you think it is. Um, and there's a lot of people that, that see everything you say. And when you were going at guys or when you're calling somebody a bum, on social media, or you're questioning somebody's character on social media, just like keep in mind that they're going to see it. Their family's going to see it. Like it's, it's tricky, right? Cause like you want to, and like, especially in like our a position, like we're in where we're our, our job at no ceilings is to evaluate players. Um, it's our job to uh, give a fair criticism, give a fair critique and, and be honest with, with where we see players and, um, and what we think of them. But at the same time, like there is still a real human element to this and it's, it's something that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, because yeah, this, a lot more people see, see what you're putting out there than, than you think. So we're, uh, we're trying to get jelly back on. Here we go. Was that me? Awesome. I, I don't know, but we got you back. So I just I just talked a little bit while you were off just about how uh, how people got to be cognizant of like it's so in the social media age, like everyone sees the stuff you're saying about them too. Like it's it's a small world, and 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 people are seeing what you put out there. So, um, can yeah, you hear me? I, yep, yeah, you're back. You're good. Are you able to hear uh, me on on your side? Oh, you're good. You're yeah. good. So so you were talking about Tulane, and yeah. This your year sitting out there. So you guys were really struggling. I think you ended that year like four and twenty seven. Yeah, you weren't we were able to play. Four and eighteen in conference. Didn't win a game. So imagine you like it's different when you're sitting and like you're watching your team and you can be like, hey, I'm I'm learning a lot from them because we're winning and I'm learning how to win. I'm learning to see what it takes, like how to practice. You know what I'm saying? How to practice the right way. How how the point guard of our team plays so I can see, okay, when I come, this is how I need to play. This is the reads I need to make. But it's like when you're 0-18, it's like you're just thinking like, like, bro, I wish I was out there to help them because I know I can help them. You know what I'm saying? And then things, yeah. I was doing, things I was doing in practice constantly, it's like I know for a fact I can help them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it was hard. It was hard. But, like, it was it was the hardest year, but I would say – the year I, I've worked the hardest in my entire life. And like, people mm -hmm. don't believe me, but this is how I changed. Like when people say like, how did you like become like a, a lethal shooter? Like I shot a thousand shots a day for seven months straight. Yeah. And yeah. people think I'm lying when I say like, I'm like my coaches at Tulane, I, I wish like they could vouch for me. Like they would ask you, might you ask Mike Dunleavy or, or coach Ramo or, or, mm -hmm. or coach Donald Flores or Tony Childs. They will all tell you, Bro, he was in the gym every day. I shot a yeah. thousand shots, not nine hundred ninety, a thousand <laughs> for seven mm. months straight, no days off, oh, man. thousand straight, and like it changed my whole jump shot. But that was like it was difficult. So for players who are transferring stuff like that, I would say to them like, I mean, it's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes you just don't work out together. And then sometimes, yeah, yeah, sometimes a coach's philosophy is 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 not like yours you know what i'm saying or sometimes maybe the coach doesn't believe that you're you're a dynamic playmaker he might just want you to be a spot up shooter you know what i'm saying and and mm -hmm. you feel like you could do that and you go somewhere else and you show that you can and your coach believes that you can do it so it's not mm -hmm. necessarily saying like you're leaving because you're a head case or you don't like you know what i'm saying or it comes with playing time because i think people leaving because of playing time is I don't agree with that one because a mm -hmm. lot of times when you don't play, it's it's probably because like you're not like 
either working hard enough or you got mm -hmm. a person in front of you who's been doing something well for so long. It's hard. Like, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? No coach is going to just be like, hey, I got trust in this dude for four years and he won me a, 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 a championship in the conference. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's going to be like, you're a freshman who knows no better. And it's just like, <laughs> hey, I'm just going to yeah. put you out there in front of him. Like, that's not realistic. You know? Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, that's what I would say to kids is just, I mean, but you have to understand that like that waiver stuff, it might not always work. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So if you're okay with sitting out a year. I mean, do what you do. Yeah. Well, I think like that's, that's part of the tricky thing too, is like you mentioned, like how a coach can envision a player versus like how a player may envision yeah, themselves. Yeah. And I think that's something that like on, on our side, we need to be aware of too, is like, this is the rest, like you were setting the table for the rest of your life Absolutely. with what you do in college. It's no different than preparing yourself or going to school to get a degree in anything. Like it's exactly. no different than like getting a business degree. Like if you feel like you're not in a good position to succeed and show the world what you can do and put yourself in a, a position to, to propel yourself for life after college, like you got to do what you got to do. Like exactly. it's, it's a business decision. And, exactly. And, and I, think, day, I think people should be more aware of that. And I feel like when it comes to business decisions, I feel like a lot of coaches uh, do business decisions with their players. You know what I'm saying? If they feel yeah. like you're not good enough for their team, he might say, hey, like, we don't want you to return next year. We need somebody else. You know what I'm saying? So That side doesn't get brought up a lot. Exactly. That side doesn't get brought up a lot. But you, you, know get, you get a lot of guys that get pushed into transfer. And there's a yeah. lot of people that get pushed into the transfer portal, but we don't, they don't speak about it a lot because they don't want to – don't, a lot of coaches don't do it because, one, they don't want other players who can come there to see, like, wow, that's what they did to a kid, or at the same time hurt that kid's reputation because what if he was a head case but the coach doesn't want to – he likes him as a person, but he understands like mm -hmm. he's bad for my basketball team. So I can't. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so yeah. well, it goes hand in hand for sure. It's complex. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. more complex than like transfer portal good, transfer portal bad. Like, yeah, but there's, I, there's a lot more to it. I think the way people look at it now is is way better than now sure. than it yeah. was back then. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, so you spent two seasons at Tulane. Yeah. Uh then then two seasons at UAB. Yeah. UAB is where you kind of blow up and become yeah. like a, a phenomenon, like yeah. a, a real like cult figure in, yeah. in college basketball. Um, so you talked a little bit about the shooting, uh, but okay. So let, let's just like do some, do some numbers here real quick. So you, uh, you were like a good, a good three point shooter yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, statistically. So you went from taking four. So your, your junior year to land, you take, 4.1 threes per game. You make 32.6% of that. Yeah. The next year you take 8.6 threes per game. So you more than double your volume, yeah. which is not a, a, not a thing that normally happens. Like yeah. as somebody who looks at numbers and watches a ton of basketball, Absolutely. this is not common. You also then go from shooting 32.6% to 39.6%. So usually if you get the percentage increase, usually the volume increase is small or does not happen. Yes. Was it just taking that many shots or did you change something mechanically? Did you change the speed of the shot? Like how, would, how does this happen? I would just say it's the confidence in my coaching. Okay. Like, and then the confidence in me to where, cause I, I never was, I never, like I said, I never played for a team to where a coach believed like, like obviously jelly, I need you to run my offense. I need you to do this. But at the same time, I know how you play and I know what shots you like to shoot. So I'm going to accept the shots that you like to shoot. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's like, I feel like it was both. I feel like it was the confidence my coach gave me in the shots I was allowed to take without coming out or getting benched. And the, and the confidence in me is just, man, like I know what shots like, like I can make and what shots I work on day in and day out, night in and night out. And I know mm -hmm. I can make them. And when it comes, when you have the confidence from the coaches, and the confidence in yourself, it's hard to like stop a player like that. Yeah, yeah. So then again, this year, another volume increase from three. You took 18 threes per 100 possessions this year. So yeah. in in like you're hitting a high clip. Like you ended up as a career 37.7 percent free th uh, three point shooter, which was like way above what you were before yeah, those last absolutely. two seasons while taking and, a ton of them. And the only reason why it really should have been 40, but the NIT tournament. I, I was in like a little bit of a slump, so it dropped. <laughs> I think I think people can live with with thirty seven point eight on, on yeah. ten point eight a game. I think that's a good a good number from, yeah. from three point land. Um, so you're like, I, I stress this a lot too. Like, there's 
and, and I wrote about Ben Shepard at Belmont this this week. And like one thing I said in that column is like there's a difference between being an efficient three point shooter and yes. being a great three point shooter. Yes. Because like a lot of guys can like stand in the corner and take a wide open three and shoot yes. a good percentage. Yes. But it's different versus like creating your own shots hitting them off the dribble hitting them flying off of a screen at movement without having your feet under you um how do you like prepare yourself to take those kind of shots because that's that's the other thing too is like this is a very high percentage the volume is very high but you get a lot of attention from defenses and these are deep threes these are threes off of movement like these are hard threes that you're very hard very yeah yeah. the way i prepare myself i mean i really i'm in the gym a lot I'm in the mm-hmm. a lot, and and I I, I work on them threes. And I, I was watching before I I think it was like before I went to UAB. Like I think the, the summer of like right when I was about to move into my uh, my apartment at UAB, I was watching like how Curry worked out. Okay. And when he shoots his threes, he goes full speed. Mm-hmm. Like he might walk back, you know what I'm saying? And that's okay with his workouts. Like he might walk back, but when he comes off like them down screens where he he's coming off. What would that? I think that would be the the left wing, and he's curling mm-hmm. left right into his shot. You know what I'm saying? He's going full speed, mm-hmm. or when he's going right left, or when he's coming up the ball screen, he's hopping into it, or mm-hmm. right left, or left right, or stuff like that, or side steps. He's doing everything he does full speed. So that's what like when people when, when I work out and stuff like that. I, obviously, catch and shoot is easy, but I try to do a lot of movement stuff. I try to do a lot of off the dribble or me just running at full speed and trying to stop on a dime and shoot. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying and and then be, and then I had to really work on it even more because my first year like conference play people were like I think it was averaging like 17 at UAB mm-hmm. before going into conference like 16 okay and went up to 20 at the end of the year yeah it was uh like people were I was getting double teamed in conference play like I was getting boxing one like mm-hmm. stuff I've never seen before you know yeah, I said yeah. my whole entire career, I've always been like a backup, or you know, what I'm saying I didn't start until my senior year, so I'm getting boxed in one, I'm getting denied full court, I'm getting double team, damn near triple teamed. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's like, if I don't score these many amount of points, we probably won't win. Yeah, dang. You know so it's like, it's like I just had to constantly work on it and, and, mm-hmm. and know that like I got to be a tough shot maker, and I've always been a tough shot maker, I just never was able to really show people I'm a tough shot maker because, you know what I'm saying, I had to play my role. And, and I'm okay yeah. with playing a role. I've always knew how to play a role, but my role at UAB was to be the star, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. was to be that guy. And um, I've always wanted it, so when I got it, I accepted it. <laughs> I, well, you did, you did well. You did well. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So, so that, that's probably how I really got to, like, making them tough shots because I really – I truly work on those type of shots. And – People think like, yo, those are crazy. I, I truly work on those shots because at the end of the day, I don't get regular shots like some people do in college. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people look at other point guards in college and be like, oh, he's so efficient. Like, look how he comes off these screens and stuff like that. But a lot of point guards in, in college, people are playing drop coverage on them because they don't think they can shoot like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's me. Mm-hmm. I'm coming up the ball screen. I'm getting blitzed till I get a ball up. It's I'm getting blitzed till I get a ball up. I'm, they're not stopping the double team till I get a ball up. You know what I'm saying, and mm-hmm. and and people who know basketball understand like, yeah, that that's that's difficult. You know what I'm saying, and for me to still be able to shoot at a high clip, you know, it's difficult, bro. Yeah, yeah, but, it's not easy. So you would say the biggest thing for your shooting was doing it at like full sprint speed yes. and not just game speed, even yes. when it's working out. Yes. yes, because sometimes in the game I might be able to slow up a little bit, maybe if they mess up. Or they get hit on one of like Trey Jemison screens, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm big dude, that. big I'm dude, not, not a guy you want screening. Exactly, you know? but for the majority of the time, I'm getting chased the mm-hmm. whole time. I'm getting chased the whole time, like whether I'm coming off the ball screen, whether I'm coming off a down screen or a flare screen or a stagger screen. It's I'm getting chased, so I have to run full speed. Yeah. So the next part of your game that I want to talk about, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna. Uh, go on a little diatribe here real quick yeah is is your passing yeah so you have a reputation as being a bucket getter because yeah. because you are that is yeah. that is something you do absolutely um but during your third college season like there's there's a noticeable leap in your game that happens as a oh, player, yeah. i think um but i think if people are just looking at you as a scorer i think it's kind of doing them 
a bit of a disservice as far as like how they're evaluating you. So um, I keep this running database of yeah. player stats that either earned second contracts in the NBA or are on pace to earn second contracts in the NBA. Yeah. Your assist rate is like right in the middle of guys that like stick in the NBA yeah. as guards. So when people are like, Oh, like he's just a scorer. It's like the assist rate is like the assist rate of like guys that stick in the NBA. And yeah, then sure. your usage is really high. Obviously you face yeah. a lot of, a lot of pressure defensively and your turnover rate this year was like half your assist rate. So like your turnover, the, the amount you turn it over in comparison to how often you have the ball and the amount of responsibility that you have is very low. Yeah. So like really like as a playmaker, you stack out, I think, better than people that are just like, Oh, that's the guy that scores a lot of points. Yes. Um, so could you just talk about your evolution as a playmaker and how you've kind of improved in that role over time, but also like the adjustments that you made this year is, and like having that year under your belt where it's like, yeah. this is my first year being the star yes. and facing all this defensive attention. And now it's kind of like slowing down for me. A little yes, bit. yes, yes. I mean, well, in high school, when I was at the Padgett school, I played with Nick Richards mm -hmm. and you know Great what I'm saying? Player. Yep. Yeah, and I played with uh, Jameer Harris. He was at Seton Hall. Mark McClary, he went to Monmouth. And I played with a lot of other great players. You know what I'm saying? So when I was in high school, I had to learn how to, like, I could always score. Like, that's one thing I've always able to do. Mm -hmm. But I had to learn how to be a true point guard. I had to learn how to be, like, all right, like, you got to get these other players involved because they're great players. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And you have to keep them happy while at the same time showcasing how good you are, how talented you are. So I've always knew how to pass the ball and be a, a floor general. But when I got to UAB my first year, they, we needed scoring. You know what I'm saying? And and, and that's what I'm, I'm really good at. Like, it's second nature to me. But mm -hmm. I also un, understood how to pass the ball, too. But at the same time, it was my first time getting used to being doubled and triple teamed and boxing one and all stuff like that. So that's why I feel like I had a high, high turnovers last year. But then this year – with the addition of Eric Gaines, you know, some stuff like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Like it did take away some of, I mean, my usage, I think was even higher this year. It, well, yeah. It did end up being, uh, yeah. it was like, it was like right in line with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was damn near the same, which is crazy. Cause people gonna be like, well, Eric Gaines had the ball. Not really. My usage is the same thing basically, mm -hmm. but it was just, I was used to people doubling me. And like in the summertime, that's what my coach constantly preached. Like even before the season, he was like, this is how teams are going to guard Jelly. Like, this is how we have to attack them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm always, always constantly thinking about, like, all right, I'm probably going to get doubled. I'm probably going to – people are going to double me, and then the opposite person from the opposite corner is going to sit in the paint. So even if I split the big, it doesn't even matter because there's a third defender right there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I had to constantly, like, watch film on myself over and over again with my coaching staff and by myself. And I had to learn, like, all right, like, this is how, like, you know what I'm saying, how to not turn the ball over. Because, mm -hmm. and I had to learn simple plays is the better plays. Yeah, okay. Just mm -hmm. keeping it simple. And and that's one thing, like, when you're a high usage guy, it's hard to think simple sometimes because there's so many people around you, or so many people, like, the ball's in your hands all the time, you know what I'm saying? So it's hard to think that. But when you start thinking, all right, less is more, less is more, less is more, unless when you're trying to go get a bucket. When you're trying to yeah. get a it that's different you have to sometimes use more of your bag than usual but when it comes to just passing the ball like if i come off a ball screen and the person on the right wing i'm coming off the right wing and the person hard hedges and that opposite the person on the right wing sinks in a little bit because he thinks i'm about to turn yep. the corner. it's an easy kick you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying stuff like that and i had to learn that more and more and more and obviously i had turnovers where i, I turned the ball over a lot sometimes but then there was other times times i had a high high assist with one maybe no, no turnovers you know and i just had to learn like less is more less is more just keep it simple keep mm -hmm. it simple keep it simple and that's just probably how i got to it and obviously facing a year of double teams and boxing one and triple teams and all stuff like that it made it way easier because i already seen it before it was yeah, yeah. Team this year that i didn't see last year for sure for sure yeah. and I, I think that showed too I, like you looked a lot more like comfortable and then like poised was yeah, the phrase that yeah. came up like in my notes like as I was going through it's like more poised it's more yeah, poised this season more yeah. poised more poised like it it definitely seemed like the game slowed down a little bit um so the the big the big knock on you is that yeah. and I'm I'm sure like you're like you're already like I'm rolling he's my sure. eyes he's too um, 
Yes. Yes. I'm sure. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, that's the big thing. And I'm sure that there are a lot of teams that are probably overlooking you or just straight up being like, we're not interested. He's, yeah. he's listed at five eleven or whatever. And like, what would be your message to either evaluators or teams that are just saying like too, too small for the NBA? I mean, I would tell them that people said the same thing about me in college mm-hmm. and don't other people get evaluated on how they perform in college? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then if you evaluate other people about how they perform in college then you should evaluate me on how I perform in college. And that's one thing I would say. And on top of it, I work hard mm-hmm. and, I, and, and I know that I'm little and mm-hmm. it's not something that is like, I just woke up with. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've been it my whole life and mm-hmm. I've overcome it time and time again. Mm-hmm. And obviously the NBA is the best players are the best players. The greats are the greats. You know what I'm saying? People are best in the world. And, and I understand that but I feel like I work hard enough and Mm -hmm. I understand that I'm going to have to work probably 10 times as hard as someone who's six, six. Yeah. I do. But at the end of the day, I feel like what I do is is special. And I feel like what I do can contribute to an NBA team, whether, whether it is being a third string point guard or a backup point guard, you know what I'm saying? Obviously like starting in the NBA, that's everyone's goal. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It is. Once you get older, you, you you have to be realistic with yourself. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? You have to be realistic with what an NBA team can see in you. And, and like mm-hmm. I said, like I can be one of them, them, them third string point guards or that backup guard to where I can come in and just control the team and make open shots and, and guard someone 94 feet. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, in college, it was hard for me to – it wasn't hard. I would say it was harder for me to try to pick up Defensively, 94 feet. Yeah. Wow, still having to carry so much of a heavy load offensively. <laughs> yeah. 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 Night in and night out. Like, that's, mm-hmm. that's not easy. You know what I'm saying? And I don't see many small guards who are, you know what I'm saying, have the uses that I had picking up people every possession, 94 feet, and then still going down on offense and doing the same thing I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? That's it's not really realistic. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, I think my Wi Fi is going out again. Oh, you're all right. You're all right. You're coming through on my side. So you're, so you're okay. Right. Um, yeah. So, and like, I think, I think part of your argument that's like in favor of you is that there are, um, oh, I think we may, we may be losing a little bit of signal here. Um, but I'll, I'm, I'm just going to kind of continue on for the time being. Um, there are guys that have made it that are this size. Like, it's not like, it's not like jelly is five one. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's not unprecedented. And I know that we're in an era that is, it's different and it's a a size based era. And that is, um, more important than it's, it's been in the past. Um, and I'm going to just resend that link to him real quick, get him back going. Um, but yeah, it's not totally unheard of. And I think a lot of the smaller players that, uh, They do make it our guys that look like jelly. Um, cool. Yeah. Oh, so I was just bro. saying, yeah, you're good. You're good. Uh, oh, so I was just saying like a lot of the guys that do make it that are on the smaller side of the spectrum are guys that kind of play like you in different ways. Like it's a guy like a, like a Patty Mills, a guy like a DJ Augustine, like it's dudes that yeah can shoot and can space the floor. Um, yeah. So what do you, at, like, what, mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, not not in the rubber, like the Patty Mills. Like mm-hmm. I feel like that's a perfect like resemblance of what I can do. Like I mm-hmm. can shoot the ball. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, I can run a team. If you need me to get buckets, I can get buckets. If you need me to get the ball to a star player, I can do it over and over. You know what I'm saying? Or put him in mm-hmm. the best position for him to be successful. You know what I'm saying? Like it's perfect. Like, that's in my opinion, that's just how I like when I look at a player in the NBA, like right now that hey like who do you think you can model your game after i would say patty mills easily Mm -hmm. yeah and that's that's a comparison i've seen a couple times like every time i see it i'm like that's that's the role like that's gonna be the if if like if it works out like that's what it's gonna look like it's gonna be that type of so is that like the role that you see yourself playing as being sort of that like the point guard that 
is a floor spacer and is like fine operating without the ball. And then occasionally like you run some pick and roll and like that sort of thing. Like, is that kind of the role you see yourself playing at the next level? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whether, cause I don't need the ball in my hands. I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've shown that in college. I don't need the ball in my hands. Like I don't have to have the ball in my hands, but if the ball needs to be in my hands, I can have it in my hands. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I space the floor enough. I mean, I shoot the, I shoot the ball well enough to where, they can't just leave me and I won't just be a yeah. liability on the floor. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm like, here's, here's the stat that I think backs up your point. I'm on synergy right now on. So this year and like this again, like just ties into like how heavily you regarded. Uh, you took 31 threes that were spot ups that were like no dribble, like just catch the ball, shoot it. You made 58.1% <laughs> of those threes this season that were no dribble, no dribble threes. Say that again. So, uh, so, so yeah, so on synergy, they track like no dribble jumpers from three where it's like situations yeah. where you're spotted up, you catch the ball. You don't, you don't have to dribble. Like you just sh shoot it. So only 31 yeah. of your threes were no dribble jumpers, which just like speaks to like the difficulty, of the shots you're taking, but you made 58.1% of your no dribble threes. <laughs> and the reason so that's, why that's a good number. No, yeah. That's, what, that's the reason why I had to dribble a lot is people, so many people, consumed with me i'm mm -hmm. getting five players in the court looking at me even if i come up for them stagger screens you know what i'm saying the baseline screens the person who's passing me the ball their person that's guarding them is hedging towards me mm -hmm. so either i can shoot it or i gotta throw it right back yeah yeah and I, I think that's another thing that you did well is i think you do a good job of like i always really value um like hyun jung lee at davidson was really good at this jordan hawkins is really good at this at uconn is yeah. the like the quick move the ball if, if the shot's not there. Yeah. Like I thought that's something that you do really well. Um, yes. So uh, we've, we've talked about your role. We've talked about your game quite a bit. What have you been most focused on during your pre-draft process? Like what element are you of your game? Are you like, I'm really trying to get this up to a higher level and like kind of the thing that you're excited to show off that might be a little new or different to, well, based on what we've seen on the college film? Obviously, I definitely want to show off I mean, I, they know I can shoot, but I don't, I don't want to show like, like, hey, he can like high volume shoot. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And range, not just on the NBA line. I mean, way further back. And yeah, I feel like yeah. College, I've showed that, but that's what I'm really trying to show at Portsmouth too. Um, the other thing I'm trying to show is like my poise and the way I read the game, and mm -hmm. where even if someone's pressuring me, I never get rattled. Mm -hmm. never look like I'm going faster than I should, even though I'm extremely fast. As I want to show people is like my handle is, I feel so confident in my handle. And you'll know that I'm confident in my handle because when they're pressuring me, I don't even, it's like, it's like the ball is literally on a string, you know? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, it's just my playmaking, playmaking for sure. You know, mm -hmm. like just making them right reads, the simple plays to where, the big is open a little slight pocket pass or got to skip it to the opposite corner because the opposite corner is helping on that roll. You know what I'm saying? Or this the reverse pivot because the opposite corner is open, but then the person on the wing drops down to the opposite corner. Now it's a reverse pivot on that wing to maybe get a two on one on the backside and stuff like that, you know? And then obviously last but not least defensively, like I'm mm -hmm. 94 feet every time, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? To show people that, Hey, I, I really could play defense and I really can get after it defensively. You know what I'm saying? And that's what I probably – like, that's the only way I played, you know what I'm saying, when I was younger. Before UAB, even at Tulane, we were in a matchup zone, but, like, that's the only way I stayed on the court was defensively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I love to hear all that, man. I'm, I'm excited to see what you do at Portsmouth. I'm excited to see what comes next in the journey after that. Yes, uh, really appreciate you taking the time. This has been an awesome, awesome interview. Um, where can people find you on social media and continue to follow the journey? Um, well, on Instagram, you can follow me at jellyfam.j. And then on Twitter, I believe my Twitter is jellyfam underscore J. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's how you can follow me and stay up uh, updated with me and, and my process uh, throughout the draft and stuff like that. So and just see what happens next to me in my basketball career. For sure. For sure. We really appreciate you having on. Uh coming on here and, and talking to us, talking about your journey and, and everything that you've got going. So we appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate everybody listening to this here. Make sure you're subscribed to the feed. Uh, we've got 
free podcast content for you every single day and free written work every day as well on noceilingsnba.com. So make sure you're subscribed to our Substack as well as this feed. And we appreciate you guys tuning in. Have a great day. Hey, man, I appreciate you having me.